Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the Holocaust Center for Humanities Lunch and Learn program. I'm Alana Cohn Kennedy, the Director of Education at the Holocaust Center. I want to thank our community partners who are helping to support today's program. The Northwest African American Museum, the Ray Wolpo Institute for the Study of the Holocaust, Genocide and Crimes Against Humanity at Western Washington University, the Jewish Federation of Greater Seattle, Temple de Hirsch Sinai, J Connect Seattle, Temple B'nai Torah, Herzl Ner Tamid, and Temple Beth Am. In their groundbreaking books, So You Want to Talk About Race and White Fragility, authors Ijioma Oluo and Dr. Robin D'Angelo challenge us all to look around the room and to notice who is in the room and who isn't. But don't stop there. Ask yourself, why? And to whatever answer you come up with, ask yourself why again. When we study history, we must always ask ourselves, who is telling the story? Who is being included? Whose perspectives dominate? And who is being left out? In the 1930s, the Nazis created hundreds of discriminatory laws based on race that allowed for the persecution of Jews. But the Nazis didn't invent racist law. They looked carefully at the United States' Jim Crow laws and laws discriminating against Native Americans. Author James Q. Whitman, in his recent book, Hitler's American Model, The United States and the Making of Nazi Race Law, explains how the Nazis took inspiration from American racism. In 1935, the Nazis would pass laws modeled on discriminatory US laws as part of the Nuremberg Laws including the Reich Citizenship Law, which stripped Jews of their German citizenship, and the Blood Law, which criminalized marriages between Jews and non-Jews. The African Americans who encountered Nazi Germany, whether on the 1936 Olympic team in Berlin or in the US segregated army in 1945, couldn't miss the glaring parallels of fighting against the race-based Nazi Germany on behalf of their own country in which they were second-class citizens. As we study and learn from Holocaust history, we must confront and own our country's racist policies that are deeply embedded in our social fabric. Jesse Owens is the Olympic icon of the 1936 Berlin Olympics, an African-American who won four gold medals in track and field, challenging Hitler's ideology of Aryan supremacy. Jesse Owens was one of 18 African-American Olympic athletes at the Berlin Games in 1936. Each of these athletes faced layers of racist restrictions and social constraints, both at home and abroad, despite their accomplishments. The new book, Olympic Pride, American Prejudice, based on the film of the same name, finally showcases the stories of these 18 individuals. With us today is award-winning and critically acclaimed filmmaker and author, Deborah Riley Draper, who brought these stories to light. The 2016 film Olympic Pride American Prejudice is a 2017 nominee for the NAACP Image Awards Outstanding Documentary Film and qualified for the 2017 Oscars. Variety Magazine named Draper to the 2016 Top 10 Documakers Watch List. She is a 2018 TEDx speaker, 2019 Scene Initiative participant, and frequent guest on panels and in media speaking on storytelling, diversity, and advertising. Her leadership in advertising can be seen in campaigns for Lamborghini, Coca-Cola Classic, FedEx, and Adidas. If you have questions for Deborah, please type them into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And throughout our conversation today, we will pause to address questions from the participants. Deborah Riley Draper, it's an honor to have you with us today. Thank you so much for taking the time to have a conversation with me and to tell all of us about these incredible African-American athletes in the 1936 Berlin Olympics. So I want to start by asking you, what inspired you to create this film, Olympic Pride, American Prejudice, and the book that followed? First, thank you for allowing me to be here and share these stories. I think these types of conversations are critically important, and I love and believe in cross-cultural dialogue. Um, to answer your question, Initially, I was writing a story on Valeda Snow. She was an African-American woman. She was a trumpet player and a jazz musician from Chattanooga, Tennessee. And I learned that she had been interned 
um, at a Nazi labor camp. And I was astounded that a black woman had been a part of the Nazi labor concentration camps. And I learned more about her and I found an article that said, I wish I had left Germany in 1936 with the other 18 African-American athletes. What 18 other African-American athletes? I only knew Jesse Owens. And once we began to do the research, we discovered that there were 18 African-Americans, including two women, Tidy Pickett and Louise Stokes, who comprised the 1936 African-American part of the Olympic team. And I wanted to know more. I wanted to know their stories. I wanted to understand why they were not a part of the history that we all knew, the part we all studied, the part that had become a part of popular culture and contemporary literature. So uh, four years of work of uh, research created the film Olympic Pride, American Prejudice. And then we took a deeper dive to really understand these athletes and understand their insights and motivations around race, class, gender, in the 1930s so that we can better understand where we are today. And that's the book that was recently released uh, by the same name. Um, I wanna show the trailer just so we can set the tone and kind of take a look at the film uh, that was initially made. Can we take a look? Best Williams of America, and here's Louval, very happy to have taken third place. This is one of the great tragedies of the story you tell, is you have 17, 18 athletes here who were on the world stage. One of them is remembered. By the time 36 came around, people began to understand who Hitler was and what his goals were. It was an opportunity on the world stage to disprove white supremacy. I love my gold medal, but it's not, in history, it's not as important as their gold medals. Like, they're, for me, there's just some, something so special about what they did and who they did it in front of. These are athletes who, who did something really important at a seminal point in hu human history. I, I'm on not African-American history, not American history, in human history. They did something incredibly important. Simply being on the medal stand in 1936 sent a message. From that struggle for legitimacy became the foundation of the struggle for access which became integrated into nonviolent direct action and primed the pump for Dr. King. They have stories that have not only drama and drive and power and force, but they are stories that can focus us again on something truly important about the human spirit and about the human race and what it takes to be truly human and not inhuman. what inspired me. Fantastic. Well, after reading the book and watching the film of the many individuals that were mentioned, I find myself thinking a lot about Louise Stokes and her experiences. And in the book, you mentioned her participation in the 1932 Olympic Games and being forced to sit in a separate room, even on a separate floor, in the reception dinner for the Olympic delegation. And then in the 1936 Games, being pulled from the final race just minutes before um, the race to, before she was able to compete. Can you tell us a little bit more about her story and what it was like researching her and her experience? 
absolutely. Louise Stokes was born in Malden, Massachusetts. She was an incredible athlete. She played basketball. She ran track. She, she really was great at a ton of sports. And she made the 1932 team along with Tidy Pickett. So these are the first two African-American women to represent the United States on Olympic teams. So 32 and 36. So their roles are pivotal in the movement of not only African-American female athletes forward, but all female athletes forward. So in 32, with amazingly speedy times, Louise was actually oppressed and subjugated to immense racism. When they took the train from Chicago, where the um, trials were, they took a train from Chicago to Denver. And when they arrived at the hotel in Denver, there was a huge banquet for them. And unfortunately, that hotel did not allow Tidy and Louise to enter in the front of the hotel with the rest of the team, nor did it allow them to reside in rooms on the floor of the rest of the team. And when it was time for the team banquet, the ladies were not invited to come down to the ballroom because it was a whites only banquet room. Even though they were a part of the team, the speediest sprinters on the team, they had to eat in the attic and listen to all the festivities that were going on below them. And when they arrived in Los Angeles, very excited, not disheartened at all, because as Black women, they had lived through a lot of racism and oppression, but they thought they were going to get a fair shake. And when it was time for them to run, they were benched in favor of white athletes who did not have their times. Um, they soldiered on, and they made the 36 team again. And the exact same thing happened to Louise again in 36. So as we understand racism and oppression and institutional racism, we have to look at the fact that Louise started her career as a young woman in high school. And she had to endure this level of, of oppression over and over and over again. And this is what happens with generational trauma. She was an amazing woman. She would go on to create the Colored Women's Negro Bowling League because she wanted a safe place for female athletes to be able to compete. And she wanted to have a place where they can compete fairly and where they could experience equity and equality. So she created that. So her experiences of inequality and inequity and ridicule and complete marginalization, she turned that into something very powerful. But when I speak with her son, as I did before um, interviewing him, she had heartbreak. And it was heartbreak earning something and having it taken away, in spite of the fact that you'd worked hard and you earned it and you were the very best. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, for this, for uh, this book and this film, you did a tremendous amount of research, which you just alluded to in your um, comment there. Can you tell us a little bit more about the research you did to uncover all of these stories and this history and the process that was involved? Absolutely. Um, the very first thing we did, um, we had this photo that had the African American athletes in them, but most of the newspaper articles didn't name the African Americans. This was not unusual at that time because um, mainstream narratives did not want to include exceptional African Americans or African Americans um, at all, not from an achievement standpoint. So we had to identify 18 people, find their stories, and find their families so we can get more information. We researched in Europe and in the United States. Uh, we went back to their small towns. I remember going to Malden, Massachusetts to the high school where Louise Stokes actually was a part of the track team and a part of the basketball team and really learning about her, looking at the classes she took, um, but also going to the universities and learning about Avery Brundage and learning about his history with the Olympics from being an Olympian to being the man in charge and making the decisions and really moving the Olympic American Olympic Committee in the direction to actually go to Berlin, even though the country was kind of split about that decision. He had a lot of reasons and a lot of incentives and a relationship with the Nazi. So that was the Nazis and that underpinned his decision to really go and bring this team there. So understanding the players, the people that were good, the people that were bad, the people that were unaware on both continents, and also tracking how both countries dealt with racism, how they kind of influenced each other in some ways, particularly in legislation, 
and looking at how African Americans would be treated on both sides of the Atlantic and how they were treated on both sides of the Atlantic. So that took about four years for the film and two additional years for the book. And, and uh, people want to know, I, I see this in the chat, I, I wanna make sure we can let them know. The film is available on Amazon Prime. It's also available on um, iTunes. It's also on YouTube Pro. The book you can get at any independent bookstore. You can buy that on Amazon as well. Um, and it's available on simonandschuster.com. That's our publisher. So that resource is available for you. We, we grounded ourselves in primary source material. So we really looked through newspapers. We looked through personal accounts. We interviewed Germans who were there in 1936, um, young, young men and women um, who were at the games. We interviewed athletes, we interviewed families, we interviewed scholars because we really wanted to uh, investigate this information because it hadn't been told before. The story of 18 African-Americans defying Hitler and Jim Crow to be on the international stage and showcase not only their athletic prowess, but their patriotism and their intelligence had not been told before. And we wanted to do that not with not only respect, but with um, scholarship and integrity. I think one of the things I really appreciated was all of that primary source material. The interviews were amazing um, and really being able to see how uh, the politics behind the Olympics and how everything, all of these um, ideas and individuals involved are really connected in different ways. Um, so another uh, question that I want to pose to you um, is that the African American athletes were faced with a conflicting pull of loyalties um, and politics and their and the social alliances when weighing whether or not to participate in the games or to boycott them. Can you tell us a little bit about the many factors they had to consider when deciding whether or not to um, continue on to Berlin? Absolutely. And, and again, I want to remind everyone, support your independent bookstores. They really need the support right now. So, so definitely find an indie bookstore and buy this book for yourself or so, for someone else. Um, the the African-American athletes, um, as all African-American people were then and now, um, for that matter, are always, W.E.B. Du Bois put it best, can you be both Negro and American? And that is a war that happens in your spirit because you are at once a second class citizen and treated um, socially, culturally, and by law as that. And then the other part of you roots so desperately for your country because you want to be a part of it and you want to show your patriotism and you want to establish the fact that you love America and you built America and you're a part of America. And, um, and, you, and you also want that opportunity to display that all of the myths and stereotypes that are being creative and created in the dominant narrative are not true. So part of the African-American community said, we can't go because we have an allegiance to the Jewish community and the Jewish community is telling us all of this information that they're getting back from Europe is not good, it's not positive, and that very ugly things are happening. And then part of the community said, we need to go because we need to take a stand and show that as African Americans, we can represent on the world stage and that we can hold our own. And so there were Jewish athletes who didn't go. There were Jewish athletes who did go. So everyone had a bit of a conflict on how they wanted to show up in this moment. And, and what we have to realize are there are lots of factors. These are young people who had been training their whole lives and they wanted to demonstrate that they were capable. And they weren't just athletically superior. They were intellectually amazing. And they also were great stewards of what was supposed to be the American democracy in our republic. And they wanted to represent accordingly. They had USA on their backs and they wore USA, even though the country did not necessarily respect them as much as they respected their love for it. Thank you. Um, so, when we hear about the 1936 Olympics, uh, we often hear about Jesse Owens and not the other African-American athletes. Um, why, why do you think this is that we hear so much about him and up until 
you kind of showcasing these stories, we've heard so little about them. How did he manage to get the spotlight? Well, there is a thing called exceptionalism that sometimes the dominant uh, narrative, the people who control the media, the people who tell the stories, at that time, they did not want to tell the story of 18 exceptional African-Americans because they were exceptional, all of them. Uh, Archie Williams was a pilot and a mechanical engineering major at Berkeley. He would come back to the war as a Tuskegee Airman. Ralph Metcalf, of course, at that moment was in the graduate program at USC and would become one of America's greatest legislators. He would become a congressman. He wrote the resolution for Black History Month, and he was a co-founder of the Congressional Black Caucus. So you're talking about immense intellect and immense physical ability. But that was not the story America wanted to hear. American newspapers knew their audiences and they told the story in such a way, Jesse was an exception and he was. He was an amazing larger than life athletic figure, but there were 18 in total, but the newspapers concentrated on one. And that one was actually used as part of American propaganda to show the Negro against the Aryan and that the Aryan lost. So that was the story that was told and that lifted up more so Jesse as a Negro athlete than Jesse Owens himself. And that's the story. And we see that over and over again, that stories of African-American success and achievement are marginalized and kept out of the picture. So you get one exception, you get one anomaly, as opposed to covering the story broadly and in its full glory. And that's what happened. But when we did our research, the story was there. It was there in the Black newspapers. It was there in the Pittsburgh Courier and the Chicago Defender. So that's how we knew. But it was also in the Nazi papers as well. They covered this story, not favorably, but it was there and it was present. And they talked about all 18 of the athletes, as did the papers in France. Wow. That's interesting. Uh, uh, for propaganda purposes, I assume. 100% for propaganda purposes. Mm -hmm. um, well, I want to turn to a question from one of our participants. Uh, this one comes from Tom. And he asks, how much racism was there in the selection process for US Olympic athletes in 1936? Were there additional Black athletes who were top performers at that time who were not included because of racism? Well, on, on the track team, um, the, the selections made to the team were based on speed and times. Now, once people were on the team, a whole lot of politics came into place. And when you look at the relay races, there were uh, subjective decisions made on who would actually race. The folks that made the team, that was a pretty objective selection because it was based on time. But could you actually compete? That's when the coaches made decisions that were based on racism. In boxing, there was a ton of racism um, in that selection process, in the voting process. And you see that play out in 1936 on the Olympic team, on the boxing team, when Howell King had to fight Buteki twice and beat him twice to earn his spot on the team. And then he was sent home before he even got to box. So racism played a tremendous role in the opportunity to compete on the international stage more so than it played in the opportunity to actually be on the team. But if you think about it, if you make the team, you certainly want the opportunity to actually compete. So kind of following up on that question, um, there was another question here from uh, Nancy, which asks, were the African-American athletes segregated in Berlin? Um, and what was the experience like for them once they got there? The athletes were not segregated in um, Nazi Germany. In the Olympic Village, all athletes had the freedoms to roam around, eat where they want to, attend movies. They received passes to experience Germany. They had world-class treatment in Nazi Germany. So part of Part of the propaganda was to demonstrate Berlin as a world-class hospitable city. So that is what those athletes experienced. It was kind of surreal for them in the fact that they didn't have to go through the back doors. They didn't have to eat in a segregated section. They didn't have to sleep in a different area. They had 
full reign of the Olympic Village. And they met people from all over the world. It was an amazing experience for all of them. All of their diaries and all of their recollections uh, talk about the fact that it was wonderful. They ne actually not actually had treatment like that before in the United States. And when they returned home to their party, they had to go back through the back doors. So um, th for those 10 days, it was pretty magical. For those 10 days, most of them felt equal and that, and that they had an experience that was for the most part equal and that the racism and the oppression that they felt in terms of options and choices were suppressed by American coaches. Now, of course, they competed under pressure because they competed under the unrelenting gaze of Hitler, the Third Reich, and swastikas flying everywhere. So as much of the great hospitality, it was very clear what the agenda was. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so the 1936 games occurred before World War II and the Holocaust and before Nazi ideology completely revealed itself to the world. Um, it's easy to analyze and appreciate the significance of the games with the benefit of hindsight as we have now. But how were the games and the success of the African American athletes viewed and portrayed at that time? Um, you know, at that, at that time in 1936, uh, the success of Jesse Owens was viewed as a blow to Hitler. The other athletes were not counted in the dominant narrative, but in black newspapers um, and in black communities, they were heroes. And they also represent a seminal moment in having agency over your experience and agency over your decision. So while they may not have had the opportunity to see that play out themselves, they planted and created a seed that would lead to, lead to athletes and the athletic experience that we know, now know. So coaches began recruiting more black athletes in the NCAA as a result of these athletes. So you see eventually the integration of baseball and, and the integration of professional sports. You have to keep in mind, one of the people on this team in 1936 is Jackie Robinson's older brother, Mac Robinson. So Mac Robinson was on the 1936 Olympic team. Mac Robinson won a silver medal in front of Hitler. Mac Robinson represented his country. And that experience of being able to compete under those conditions and that experience helped his brother, his little brother, Jackie Robinson, have the resolve to be able to do what he would do on a bigger scale. So the impact of what they did is tremendous. We still feel that impact to this generation. So without black female athletes like Tidy Pickett and Louise Stokes, you don't get the, the Wilma Rudolphs, you don't get the Allison Felix, you don't get the, the Venus and Serenas. It, start, it started with them, they're the first. Someone has to always bear the brunt. Someone always has to take the blows and they did. And we, and we are grateful and thankful that they did. Yeah, it seems like what you've portrayed is that this was a real turning point in, in many ways in history. Um, in, in the film and the book, um, you also talk about the lesser known story of three Jewish athletes, one German and two Americans. Could you recap these stories for us and tell us a little bit about their significance in the broader context of your film and book? Absolutely. Gretel Bergman, um, is rather extraordinary. I, I have to say, before I talk about her, she was married to her husband for 75 years. So it's a very long time. <laughs> um, and, and, and they met in, in Germany. And, and she, um, her father sent her to England as he began to discover that bad things were happening to German children and German women in particular. So she was an athlete then. So think about this. She's a German Jewish athlete in the 1920s. And um, as she's coming up as a young woman, her father realized that she would have a better opportunity if she competed for the, Brit for the British Empire. So he sends her to London. Um, as part of Hitler's propaganda and part of his promise to Avery Brundage, who was on the American Olympic Committee, he was in charge of it. He said, we'll have uh, Jewish athletes on the team course. And so they made Gretel Bergman come back home 
She had to leave England and she was told she would have to compete for Germany. And she said, fine. They pressured her father to make that decision. So she had to make that decision for her family. It wasn't a decision made of her own um, volition. Um, and, and they announced that we have a, a German high jumper, Gretel Bergman, on the, on the German team. So everything's fine. Everyone's believing that this is going to be an integrated in terms of Jewish uh, athletes on the German team. When the Olympics came around, they benched Gretel Bergman. They sent her a letter saying she's not going to be competing. She's not going to be a part of the team, but they can give her standing room only tickets. And when I went to visit her and spend time with her in Queens, she still had that letter that was signed by Hitler. It was quite chilling for me to look at. And um, we, we, we shared a silent moment um, because I can still see all these years later, that letter held such tough and hard memories for her. She lost her parents in the Holocaust and she was able to escape um, to New York. And separately, her husband, who was also a track star, lost his family and he was able to escape to New York. And they met and they fell in love and they were in love for a very, very, very long time. Um, and they have a beautiful story. Um, Sam Stoller and Marty Glickman were young. Um, they, they were two young guns in college, uh, two Jewish athletes. Um, and one was at Michigan, one was at Cincinnati and they had made the Olympic team and they were gonna represent for Jewish athletes because there were a lot of athletes who said they weren't going. But these two young men, and keep in mind, Sam's 18 at this point. He's a freshman in college. They are excited. They've made their first Olympic team. They're on the boat. They're meeting Jesse and Ralph and, and they're having what is what boys do on a, on a boat for 10 days as young men. They play games, they talk about girls, they try to, they try to get dates. They're having a great time. They get to Germany and it's time for the relay. And Avery Brundage gets a word from Hitler that they don't want to see these Jewish athletes run. They made the relay team and it was time for the relay. They were replaced. So they didn't get a chance to compete in any competition whatsoever. So they made the team. They sailed to Berlin for 10 days, like Louise Stokes. They participated in the uh, opening ceremonies. They practiced, they trained, they ran, they spent time in the Olympic Village. They met all the other athletes, but they never got an opportunity to complete because they were Jewish, just like Louise didn't get the opportunity to compete because she was a black woman. So we tell those stories because it's important to see the similarities in experience as well as the difference, but that, but that need for two countries to oppress citizens, whether it was Gretel Bergman, whether it was Marty, whether it was Sam, whether it was the 18 African Americans, we wanted to show a balanced picture between the, the experience that a young Jewish girl, a young Jewish boy, a young African American boy, a young African American girl, because Howell King had that same disappointment and that same level of feeling disregarded that Marty and Sam had. These young people shared that and they were at the hands of adults who made these decisions. And it's heartbreaking when you think about it. And it's a lesson um, for all of us to really understand what institutional racism is and what it does to a community and to a country and how it perpetuates not only generational racism, but generational trauma. And that's what we have to heal. And that's what reconciliation is all about. That's a good segue into another question that I have for you. In a previous interview um, that I listened to, you mentioned using art as protest. And as a filmmaker and author, you seem to have a mission beyond just telling stories. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I think as a writer and a director and a creator, I need to have intentionality about what I write and what I create and what I direct. And um, I think there's an obligation. My mom was an educator so, and quite an intentional woman. Today is her birthday, as a matter of fact. And um, so I, I attribute uh, this talk to her. Um, she taught me so much about research. She taught me so much about understanding the importance of history. And I think um, as, as an artist, I think history 
and the impact of it, history will always infuse itself in my work because I like primary source materials. I like researching, I love archives. And I think it's important that we have something to say, um, or at least for me, I just don't want to create something that doesn't have a point of view because I have a point of view and uh, my great grandmother couldn't express her point of view. My grandmother couldn't express her point of view. Um, it was only after college um, that my mother was able to fully express her point of view. So um, the opportunity to express my point of view, I don't take it lightly. Um, so it's important that the art itself isn't marginalized and that is a protest, right? To be able to have agency over what I say and what I create, that is protest. That is demonstrating the importance of having the ability and the freedom to create without being suppressed. I wanna pause and take a few questions um, from some of our participants. And this one has been asked by a couple of people, but I'll read, um, I'll read it from Martin here. And he says, can you say anything about the overall American white participants in the 1936 Olympic team in terms of their reaction to the American black athletes that had made the team? And I know you outline a couple great stories and references to that. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Can you repeat the first part of the question? It cut out for me. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, can you say anything about the overall American white participants in the 1936 Olympic team in terms of their reaction to the American black athletes that made the team? Yes, um, there were 400 American athletes on the team. 18 of them were black. So that, that was a very small contingency on the American team. And they were welcomed by most of them. There were still, still some Southern athletes that weren't comfortable being on a boat with African-American athletes for 10 days. And, and, and they didn't mind sharing that they weren't comfortable, but the vast majority of these students, these athletes were fine. I think they were more concerned at that point about their training and, and not being sick on the boat. So the, the other athletes accepted them. Um, with the, you know, there's always going to be a few that will bring their racist ideology on the boat with them, and they did, but they did not represent the vast uh, P POV of the other athletes. The other athletes embraced these guys because they, they were the best of the best. These athletes had already beat them time and time again, so they knew they had the privilege of being on a boat and in an Olympic village with the best world-class athletes that they could be around, and there was a lot for them to learn. And so the camaraderie was great. Um, for Tidy and Louise, for the most part, the camaraderie was great as well. And when they got to the Olympic Village, they were embraced from, by women from around the world. And that felt really good to them because they had had such a bad experience in 32. So another question that's here, this one comes from Sarah. And she asks, has Germany acknowledged this history? And I just want to expand on her question a little bit also and ask, um, I believe you went to Germany in your research. And, and what was it like researching this story while you were there? Um, we spoke with several scholars while we were there. And they embraced us telling the story and actually provided the vast majority of the footage um, that you see from the German perspective. Um, there was not a lot of coverage of the African-American athletes in film in America. That coverage, those, the cameras, those were cameras from Hitler. That was Lenny Riefenstahl and the 32 cameras that she had on the ground covering this event. So the vast majority of the footage that we have to prove that 18 African-Americans defied Hitler was actually from Hitler's own cameras. So uh, this was the first televised game in 1936. So when you look at Lenny Riefenstahl's film, Olympia, you don't see these athletes in it because they're edited out because that was what Hitler requested, not to see any black athletes in the film. But the footage didn't die. The footage was still there. So we were able to get it. So you can see the high jump competition with Cornelius Johnson. You could actually see them in the stands, in the stadium competing. And, and it's absolutely wonderful. And everyone was very honest and they were very open, and they were forthcoming about the racism. They were forthcoming about what transpired. 
Um, they were also forthcoming about America's participation and support of, of the games and, and the actual marketing and the money that was exchanged um, as a part of these countries coming. Uh, you know, sports, even though amateur sports is amateur sports, it's a business. And, it's, and, and America was in the business of, of capitalism and, and that played out in these games as well. So another question that I have here from Carl asks, did any of the 18 African-American uh, team members write or publish memoirs about their experiences in the 1936 Olympics? And were you able to use any of their accounts in your research? I used some diary accounts in their research, not, not their memoirs. Um, Ralph Metcalf um, has a great Metcalf collection. And so we had some exposure to that collection, but not fully. So a lot of it is their actual words. Um, we had the actual oral history from James Laval and Archie Williams. So that was amazing. We had an oral history from John Woodruff, his very, very words. And we had lots of first person interviews in the black newspapers. So we had great exposure to their words and their experiences, but um, they didn't write memoirs in that, in the traditional sense. So there's a lot going on in our world today. And I think um, while this research is always important, it's even more important today um, as we're, looking at um, how we understand our own history in the United States. And, and right now, I'd like to ask you, what, what would you like to see from organizations like our Holocaust Center and even the audience and other allies? How can we support this work? And um, what would you like to see from the rest of us? to tell you today is a great step in what we need to do. Cross-cultural dialogue is critically important. People don't want to talk about history. People don't want to talk about what's uncomfortable. They don't want to talk about something that happened in the past that they don't feel connected to or that they don't want accountability for or they don't want to be, con you know, say that I'm a part of a system that did something bad. But we have to establish that right? We have to be able to say this happened, whether it was a Holocaust, a murder, a lynching, slavery, reconstruction, the Freedmen's Bureau, 400 years of institutionalized racism. We have to acknowledge that. And we have to say we can do better. And we have to do it in unison as a team. It's not one part of the country's responsibility any more than it is the others. It's all of us, but the people who have power, the people who have more agency, the people who have more platform like you, the people who have constituents, it's important that you pause and say, and ask yourself the questions you posed at the very beginning. Why? Why did this happen? Let's understand that. And let's also understand how we prevent these types of catastrophic generational trauma from happening again. How we vote. If there's voter suppression in your town, then, then you have to say something about it. If, if, if there's institutional racism at your job, you have to say something about it. When you have a wonderful institution like yours, having someone like me who's not a member of your institution have a conversation with you at a lunch and learn is the very beginning. And then encouraging people to go see the film, host your own screening at your own house with your own family and have a real open, honest conversation about the experience. Look at it from the Jewish perspective, look at it from the black perspective, look at it from the white perspective, look at it from the American perspective, the German perspective, dissect it, play with it, tear it apart, interrogate it, and then ask yourself, what about this would you change? What do we not need to relive ever, ever, ever again? And these are the things that we need to do. So if we spend an hour or two or three a week um, in cultural conversations and in intellectual conversations, watching art, 
that you wouldn't ordinarily watch, reading a book that you may not read, um, having a conversation with someone that doesn't look like you. As African Americans, um, we don't always need allies. Um, I don't always use the word allies because um, I feel like allies are, you're disconnected, you're a little bit far from me. It's like, think about it. Look at who the allies were in World War II. Are they still our allies? Look at the allies in World War I. Allies feels like it's a military term. It doesn't feel like we have the same mission. It feels like we have the same enemy. Because sometimes allies don't like each other, but they have a common enemy. So they come together for a common enemy. I don't think we have a common enemy. I think we have a common responsibility and that makes us partners and that makes us colleagues and that makes us a community with a common problem that we need to address, but not as allies, as humans. Is there, is there another term that you would use other than allies to be more thoughtful? Well, you know, I, I, I think we are human beings and we need to respect, uh, someone said co-humans, but yes, we need, we, need to, we need to understand that we're all human beings and I want you to be human to me and I'll be human to you. Humankind, that is to be human and to be kind. And if we can start there, I think that's the best place to start. And what will develop will be positive, healthy relationships, partnerships, collaborations and I, and I think that's that's more fitting um, if you have a best friend I don't know if you would call them an ally you just say they were your best friend yeah you know? I love it I think that's really that's re important I take that to heart I, I I hear you I I think that's really important yeah. um, I want to move move slightly to another question from one of our um, participants because uh, this is a, a very interesting question, and it says, as a result of your research, did you form an opinion about Avery Brundage? I did. I formed an opinion of Avery Brundage. Um, you know, in the film, uh, you know, several of the scholars say he's a die in the wool races, um, and, and his behavior and his thinking was of a man that did not consider anyone other than himself and he certainly did not have the best um intentions for african-american athletes uh from his growing up in chicago throughout his career he has demonstrated that he it was more pro nazi than pro-american his behavior in the 1936 ben benching the black athletes and the jewish athletes then in 1960 in 36 he did that then in 68 he benched Tommy Smith and John Carlos, after they won, they couldn't compete, their medals were stripped. And then we are all aware of what he did in 1972 in allowing uh, the games to go on and not paying attention to the murders that transpired. So that is his history. And his history has involved uh, allegiances with people who marginalize, oppress, and create rules to be racist against Jewish Americans, Jewish Germans, Black Americans, and um, unilaterally oppressing and stripping people of their rights. So that is my opinion of him. I, I do not think highly of what he did. I think he was a man of his generation. I don't think he was the only one who made those kinds of decisions and choices at that time. But because he was on the international stage, he had the opportunity in so many instances to do the right thing and he didn't. One person in the comments mentioned that this could be your next movie. <laughs> maybe maybe uh, a profile on him is yet to come. Um, <laughs> um, what are you most proud of with the making and release of this film and this book? Everything. I'm proud of these athletes i'm proud of their families i'm proud of what they did for america i'm proud that they came back to fight in world war ii i'm proud that the Louvao center at ucla is named after jimmy Louvao. um before we did this story no one knew their names they were the hidden figures of sports 
Um, and they're not that any longer, and I'm proud of that. But I will tell you the shining moment for us, going into this, we knew that these athletes um, were not invited to the White House. And you know, it's a tradition for athletes to get invited to the White House. They were not invited to the FDR White House. Even the, the incredible Jesse Owens was not invited to the FDR White House. And we wanted to make that right. So for 80 years, they were snubbed. Um, and with great support from the Obama White House on September 29th, 2016, the families, many of the families of these 18 African-American athletes were invited to the White House with Team USA and their contributions to American sports were acknowledged. So they weren't hidden figures any longer. We played the film at the National Portrait Gallery immediately following their visit with President Obama, First Lady Michelle Obama and Vice President Biden. Um, we have a little clip from uh, that time when they were at the White House in 2016. That is everything to me. <laughs> It wasn't just Jesse, it was other African-American athletes in the middle of Nazi Germany under the gaze of Adolf Hitler that put a lie to notions of racial superiority, whooped them, and <laughs> taught them a thing or two about democracy uh, and taught them a thing or two about the American character. So we're honored to have many of their families here today. We want to acknowledge them as well. I love that clip. Um, so Deb that day, just lots of crying. <laughs> Deborah, there's a comment here from Sarah, uh, and this is the last one I'll take from our participants, but she says, the medal winners' names are um, on the U.S. Holocaust Encyclopedia, U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum's Encyclopedia page um, about African Americans at the Olympics. The women are not named. Can you help to change that so the women get the recognition also? I think that's something we can work on. I think that's absolutely something we can work on. As a matter of fact, um, we, we, when we, we spent some time with the curator at the US um, Holocaust Memorial Museum and added a couple of the names just to the scholarship. So um, we, we did that for the USOC. We did that for everyone because these 18 names were nowhere. So I will accept that challenge. And <laughs> Alana, let's work on that together. Because we can do that. that. That's one we can definitely accomplish. We don't um, any marginalized women. <laughs> that's right. Um, Deborah, tell us what's coming next for you and what you're working on now. Yes, well, absolutely. Um, e. Smith just wrote, wow, the film Olympic Pride American Prejudice has 100% approval on Rotten Tomatoes. We do. We have 100% <laughs> reviews, positive reviews. So yes, it is a must see. Go see it. Um, it's, it's great. So thank you, thank you, thank you, E. Smith, for posting that. Um, I'm working on a, a docu-series, a documentary, and a feature film called Coffee Will Make You Black. It's based on the book by April Sinclair. It's a coming of age story of a super smart African-American girl in the 60s. She's entering high school for the first time and her world is literally changing around her. Um, she's meeting boys and best friends and she's having conflicting ideologies with her mother um, and the civil rights movement and the black power movement is all happening and it's happening around her and she has to figure it all out. Um, before she graduates. So uh, that's the story. It's fun. Think of it as Stand By Me on the south side of Chicago in the 60s in the midst of the civil rights movement with four Black girls having a good time trying to grow up. I can't wait. I can't wait. It sounds fantastic. And Deborah, I just want to thank you so, so much for having this conversation with me today, um, for joining our program at the Holocaust Center's Lunch and Learn. Uh, for everybody out there, this program was recorded, so you can find it on our website starting tomorrow if you wanna share it with other people. Thank um, you. Deborah, it's been an amazing pleasure and honor to talk to you and to have you on this program. I really, really appreciate it. Tell Hannah Wakefield, I said thank you. She said happy birthday to my mom. My mom, <laughs> my mom passed away 
And um, so thank you so much for saying that to me. It means everything. And I'm glad to be able to do this on her birthday. I know she would be very, very proud. So thank you for inviting me and, and allowing me to have this conversation. It was meaningful and powerful and important. Thank you and happy birthday to your mother, for thank sure. You so much. Um, thank you again to all of our participants for joining us today for this program. We couldn't offer programs like this one without our supporters. So if you're able, please consider making a donation on our website, holocaustcenterseattle.org and just click the donate link in the top right corner of the page. Thank you for your support. At the Holocaust Center for Humanity, it takes a motivated and dedicated team to offer our many programs, um, like these Lunch and Learn programs that we've been doing every week. And I want to give a special thank you to Richard Green, our museum and technology director, who is running the technical side of this show behind the scenes. Also, our executive director, Dee Simon, and our entire team, Nicole Bella, Lori Wurschel, Cohen, our education team, Julia Thompson, Paul Regelbrug, and Rosa Campos, Amanda Davis, our senior operations and engagement officer, our development team, Sydney Dreisel and Ellie Seleski, and our administration coordinator, Katie Lawrence. I hope you all can come back and join us next Tuesday at the same time for a program with Holocaust survivor, author, and scholar, Lorene Nussbaum, who as a child, Lorreen and her family left Germany for Amsterdam where she befriended Margot and Anne Frank. And Lorreen will look back on the last 80 years from Anne Frank's Amsterdam to present day Seattle. So with that, that concludes our program. And Deborah, again, thank you so much for joining us. And I hope we can continue this conversation in the future, it would be an honor. It is an honor for me and we certainly can. Anytime you wanna call me back, I'll be there. And if and if and once the pandemic's over, I'll actually come from Atlanta to see you in person and we can have a really intimate chat. Thank you. I would love that. I would absolutely love that. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Bye. Thanks everybody. Have a good afternoon. You too. Bye.